The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Vesheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Vesheroff. Although terrorism has plagued humanity for hundreds of years, its nature hasn't changed. Whether their cause is based in religion, ideology, or nationalism, terrorists use violence against societies and governments to achieve political change. What motivates individuals to kill themselves and others? Does poverty contribute to the terrorist mindset? And should policymakers look to psychology to address the root causes of terrorism? To find out, Policy Watch is joined by Walter Reich, Yitzhak Rabin Memorial Professor of International Affairs, Ethics and Human Behavior at the George Washington University, and editor of Origins of Terrorism, Psychology, Ideology, Theology, States of Mind. And now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besherall. Walter Reich, welcome to Policy Watch and the University of Maryland. Pleasure to be here. You've written this, um, you've edited this wonderful book, The Origins of Terrorism, and in there you describe uh, uh, the, let me read it to you because I think I want to ask you uh, what you meant. The basic psychological mechanisms that enable all human beings that contravene the deepest moral precepts that ordinarily constrain them. And I take that you mean to take life and to also take life as part of a suicide act. The, ass- the assumption uh, most of us have is that um, one doesn't kill innocents. One doesn't just massacre human beings who are uh, not involved uh, in military combat, wearing a uniform, engaging in uh, military violence that is ruled by certain principles of war, rules of war. Uh, and yet these people not only do that, they're not only ready to kill, they're ready to die. And that seemed, when I first got involved with the subject, uh, simply the first amazing reality of the issue of suicide bombing, that people were ready to do this. Why? How? And let's talk about that. But as you know, and as our audience knows, this kind of suicide action and even bombing goes back more than a hundred years. Someone once said dynamite is the great leveler of uh, the uh, rebel in the government. But let's just start from the 70s and 80s because I think many people forget how much terrorism there was even in Western Europe and and a little bit here in the U.S. Uh, Who were those terrorists? What were they like? Well, if we're talking about the terrorism of that period, uh, we are talking mostly about terrorism in, in Western Europe, but also some in the United States, such as the Weathermen, who were ready to blow buildings up. They also killed people. And they were people who were uh, largely motivated by ideological forces, by ideological convictions. Uh, they believed society should be a certain way, and... Uh, using this means they could rearrange society to satisfy their ideological aims. And we forget how widespread. I have some statistics from the book. Italy, between 1969 and 1986, 17 years, 415 deaths from terrorism, 1,100 people injured. In 1979 alone, 2,500 terrorist attacks. It's almost as if we've forgotten that when we think about contemporary Baghdad or Jerusalem or whatever, that this has been a tool. There was terror, and it's the goal of instilling terror in the hearts of people that is the goal that motivates the strategy of of terrorists. Now, you've written, as a psychiatrist, that we should think differently about some groups or types of terrorists and others. Uh, These from the 70s and 80s, how should we think about them? I think that the ones we were talking about, the ones in Western Europe, the ones in um, 
in, in the United States. The Bader Mein Hof Gang. The Bader Mein Hof Gang, the, uh, the Red Brigades, and so on in, in Europe, were able to formulate ideological formulations regarding uh, uh, terrorism. The terrorism that we're facing today is largely religiously motivated uh, and religiously sanctioned uh, and officially religiously sanctioned. So people, some, some people have written about this group right. as having some kind of psychological characteristic that set them apart from the general population. Yes. During, during the period of the uh, terrorism that uh, took place in Europe, Western Europe, and the United States, and especially in Western Europe, there were uh, academics, there were psychologists, psychiatrists, who studied individual as well as group um, psychology of these people. And there were all kinds of theories. These are not the kinds of things you can ratify by blood tests or, you know, in some kind of objective manner. Uh, but there were theories about rebellion against uh, previous generation, against parents, the kinds of uh, theories that one can almost predict. Uh, uh, are you sympathetic to them? Do you no. agree? No. Uh, I think it's hard to answer the question to them are you sympathetic to them? Because there were lots of them. So some seemed more plausible than others. Um, um, if you were, to, of course, to talk to the terrorists, they would get mad at you because they would say, I have a goal. Stop trying to psychoanalyze me. Uh, that, didn't tr that didn't stop anybody from trying to psychoanalyze them. <laughs> but people say... They but there was, as, as you say, there was this belief that, well, maybe it was the way their parents raised them, or maybe it was some sort of trauma, and right. so forth. That is not the case for contemporary terrorism. No. It's quite different, I think. And the terrorism that we face now uh, is sanctioned largely uh, by religion, motivated by religion, uh, and uh, religious goals uh, that are religious political. Um, and the two dimensions, religion and politics, really can't be separated uh, in the part of the world from which that terrorism is coming. So you disagree with those who say that this terrorism is caused by poverty and despair, and that if we go to the root causes of poverty, this terrorism disappears? Uh, I think that's uh, a, major mis a major misunderstanding, a major mistake. And I say it's major not because... Not because uh, it's so terrible that academics think it, but because policymakers think it. And when policymakers think it, they go down a certain route in which they create policies that involve developing programs and investing money uh, in, um, uh, in the hope that doing certain things is going to change certain um, circumstances. Uh, there's a great deal of evidence that uh, poverty is not the issue for a number of reasons. For example, the 9-11 hijackers did not come from impoverished backgrounds. Um, uh, they were largely middle class or more or higher. The, um, the, the uh, suicide terrorists uh, in, who attack Israelis uh, uh, are, by and large, not people who come from especially impoverished backgrounds compared to others. Um, political despair uh, would, if, 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 it, if poverty and political despair motivated terrorism and was the main motivator of terrorism, why isn't Africa far poorer than these areas in the Middle East uh, and Indonesia um, um, uh, full of terrorism? Why isn't India the, the parts of India that have the most terrorism are the, the, are the parts that are best off financially. And the striking thing is, if, you, if we think about this argument about it being caused by poverty or despair, one is struck by the fact that whatever is stated to be the cause, terrorism has, at least in the last 10 or 20 years, been tremendously successful. Yeah. Going back to, for example, uh, the multinational force in Beirut, yeah. where two or three terrorist bombs forced the United States, France, and other countries to leave Lebanon. Right. What's the impact of the fact that the 
terrorism can seems as if it seems as if it's a very good rational strategic weapon. Not only seems, Doug, is it works. Uh, it has a great effect. Uh, the head of uh, Hamas until he was assassinated, Rantisi, a pediatrician um, who believed in, uh, ironically, physician-assisted suicide, um, but of a different sort than the one we know, uh, said, we don't have F F F-15s. These are our F-15s. And yes, we will continue to blow Israelis up until there's no Israel. And it works. It worked in Spain. It worked in Spain. A few bombs, uh, a few knapsacks mm -hmm. filled with bombs, terrible thing, two or three hundred people killed. Right. And Spain left the war in Iraq. That's right. Uh, but that's why it works strategically. Yep. How do we get a young person, a young man or a young woman, uh, to strap a bomb on yep. and go and push the button? How does that work? Do we know? There were, there used to be studies, uh, there were studies, uh, which led to uh, conclusions many, many years ago, some of which are expressed in that book, uh, that a lot of these suicide bombers in uh, Lebanon, for example, uh, were suicidal, actually depressed and suicidal. Um, the person who advocated that theory and did a lot of that research, but who continues to do research, proved himself to be a remarkably honest and rare academic who said, I was wrong, uh, because the terrorism that is now carried out by suicide bombers, often kids who are 14, 15, 16, were told to go through a checkpoint, and when you're there, push the button, and there's somebody standing nearby watching, and if he doesn't push the button, the other person pushes the button uh, by remote control. Um, uh, are not motivated by suicidality. Uh, they are primed by um, uh, teachings, for example, teachings in, uh, on television in, in, uh, in the Palestinian territories in the West Bank and Gaza on Palestinian Authority television that uh, martyrdom, which is another word for allowing yourself to be killed or actually blowing yourself up in a suicide operation, is a great thing. You go to heaven. It is the goal of every Palestinian. Um, there is uh, similar teaching in Lebanon and elsewhere. And if you're primed that way, if you learn it all the time, um, some number of people are going to be ready to accept this. And it's not, it's sometimes difficult to recruit people, sometimes not so difficult to recruit people. What's really interesting is that uh, the recruiters who say it's such a great thing to uh, give your life and join paradise in paradise with uh, whatever reward you're going to get uh, don't happen to do it themselves. Well, I was quite struck in our conversations before the show about some of the techniques that are used to make sure that these suicide bombers follow through. And it yep. almost seems as if they've had some psychiatrist helping them think it through. Yeah, that would be an interesting question about it. There are not many psychiatrists in these in these areas, psychiatry has a kind of stigma that it uh, used to have in this country and elsewhere. It still has to some extent. But you mentioned, for example, many of these are actions that are taking place with two or three bombers, so that you right. get this group cohesion. Right. There are there are groups. There are people who um, who uh, train them. Um, there is an ever escalating expectation this is going to happen. There are Photographs taken, there are video clips uh, announcing, holding a Kalashnikov, I'm going to do such and such. And it's pretty hard to back out once you've done that. Occasionally they try. Occasionally they don't push the button. And then somebody else does it for them. Or if there's nobody else to uh, detonate the device nearby uh, and they get caught, they, those are the ones who live to tell the story of how all this developed. Now, you mentioned about martyrdom, and I do want to ask you about the role of Islam, but we should probably emphasize beforehand that there have been and are terrorists who are not Muslim. Right. We talked about what happened in Italy, and um, the Sri Lankan terrorists are right. certainly not Muslim. Uh, and there are many Muslims, Arabs, 
Arab Muslims and others who have never committed any terror Absolutely. Attack. But is there something about Islam that m- creates a more fertile ground for this kind of suicidal terrorism? This is a short question with such a long answer I won't even try except to say that um, certain developments, I think, that took place over hundreds of years in, for example, Christendom, in which religion and the state uh, gradually, after much bloody um, warfare, separated, um, uh, didn't happen in the same way in the evolution of Islam. Uh, And there's an ultimate goal of religion, since it's the absolute truth, uh, determining the rules of the society and of the state. Uh, and uh, the goals of many of these terrorists, such as uh, al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, is to establish a caliphate which is a uh, Muslim-ruled, not only dominated, but ruled uh, zone of the world, ever-expanding perhaps, uh, in which Sharia, a Muslim law is going to rule and his brand of Sharia, which is not a very liberal brand of Sharia. It's very strict and um, uh, and an absolute form, uh, which is not practiced in his judgment and in the judgments of his uh, colleagues by uh, the rulers of the places where, in fact, Islam is the official state religion, um, and absolutely so. Others, other religions are not permitted, such as Saudi Arabia. And his first goal is to get rid of the Saudi uh, rulers and the other rulers in the in the in that area who they who he believes don't practice proper Islam and uh, violate the rules and so on, and and also the other enemies outside of of the Arab world. Well, I've tried to I've, I've tried to think about this, and and with the picture of Beirut in my mind a handful of suicide bombers in right. effect forcing the United States out of Lebanon there's yeah. no other way to talk about it and this was under President Ronald Reagan right. this is not live Democrats and Republicans and so forth we just turned tail and ran we right. we did not do ourselves right. Right. any honor in the situation um, so I suppose if I thought that Saudi Arabia was violating my deepest held religious beliefs, and we all know how corrupt important parts of that society are. Um, and if I thought what was propping it up was the United States, I might think, boy, if I can do something like what happened in Lebanon, maybe the United States would turn and run. I think the attacks against the United States uh, had a number of goals, one of which was that, um, and the other of which was that, uh, you know, we are in, we not only have boots in Saudi Arabia, as the Pentagon likes to say, had them certainly after the first Gulf War, um, and uh, still have a great presence there, and now, of course, in Iraq. Uh, but um, we export, we, we have a presence there in other ways that are in some ways more powerful, which are, which is through the airwaves, television, movies, uh, we pollute the minds of people who shouldn't be thinking, of, we, we show things that, in after all in Saudi Arabia, women, uh, may have to cover everything except their eyes, uh, and you know what's on our television uh, screens. Well, it's on Al Jazeera too though. Having watched some of it, well, they're not. They, uh, they're not undressed, but they're, they're not. Undre- no, they're they're more they're they're dressed as uh, modern people, but they're not they're not wearing the kinds of things or not wearing the kinds of things that one can see. They don't have wardrobe malfunctions. No. <laughs> now, when Japan attacked the United States, Pearl Harbor. I think it's the case, I think it's been established, very few people in Japan thought that they, they could come over here, uh, conquer the entire, they, no plans to yeah. do that. They thought, punch us in the nose, mm-hmm. and we let them do whatever they wanted to do in China. Mm-hmm. Um, in the end, that was a tremendous misjudgment. Do you think that's what happened 
on September 11th? A tremendous misjudgment? On the part uh, of... On the part of no. uh, bin Laden? No. Why not? Um, I, I think... I don't think that... I mean, I'm, it's obvious that, that uh, al-Qaeda doesn't have divisions. Uh, and uh, doesn't uh, intend to and never intended to invade the United States in, its, in any um, conventional sense. Uh, but I think that um, their goal, and the goal of terrorism traditionally for you know, many hundreds of years, has been to use public, large, shocking, terrorizing actions to accomplish certain political goals. Uh, and I think uh, they accomplished, from their point of view, a great deal on 9-11. Our society has in important ways changed. Uh, our levels of fear uh, have increased. For the first time we felt vulnerable. I think the uh, consensus reaction uh, in the American public was that we are no longer protected by the wide oceans that, that surround us. Let's talk for a few minutes about what to do to prevent terrorism. And I and, and broadly from either um, further acts or to prevent more people from becoming terrorists. And, but let me start by saying I recognize that in some respects that's almost impossible. We have American homegrown terrorists. Uh, we did have an American or one or more Americans blow up a federal right. building in Oklahoma. Right. But how should we think about preventing future terrorist attacks? The, you know, the 9-11 Commission recommended three things, basically. It recommended um, uh, attacking terrorists, terrorist targets. It recommended uh, increasing our own security. The, the first is a military recommendation. Uh, the second is a domestic recommendation of the sort that we're, we've been talking about, uh, protecting airports, or protecting uh, nuclear sites, and so on. Um, and the third is preventing the growth of Islamist terrorism. Islamist terrorism means not um, the terrorism of the religion of Islam, but of, of, of Islamists. That is, political Islamists, people who are, are extreme um, uh, Muslims who believe in Islamism, uh, militant Islam. And that third recommendation, the first two recommendations, we understand. We we're over in Iraq, and whether we like it or not, we're Afghanistan, Afghanistan, which was the source, which was the state sponsor of Osama bin Laden, and which harbored him, and which made it possible for him to have an entire country to roam around and do it and have training camps, um, uh, was uh, something about which I think every American has, uh, uh, not every American, you, you can't have an agreement by every American on anything, but uh, but most Americans are utterly uh, convinced we should have uh, gone in there. Uh, and, and fighting terrorists uh, is, I think, in general, a consensus no matter what a person's particular views are regarding our actions in Iraq. Um, and I think there's an absolute consensus that we have to protect ourselves as inconvenient as it is to go through what we have to go through and as expensive at airports and ports and so on. And the third? And the third is preventing the growth of Islamist ter terrorism. And I think that that is uh, the hardest uh, idea to conceptualize and to follow through on. It's actually not such a hard, hard idea to conceptualize. It's, it's, a good, it's a great goal. But how do you change a religious culture? How do you uh, affect minds? And that is very difficult. And as Americans, we are especially unprepared to uh, do something like that or understand it because I don't think we really understand fanaticism as a culture. One of the reasons we've had a largely uh, and remarkably successful history in society as a civilization, as a society, is that we've been able to tolerate differences and we've been able to shave off the edges of, um, of desires so that we're not absolute in what we want. Um, but it did take us a 
few thousand years with numerous we're religious about wars. America. I know, but well, we're part of the Western tradition. True. Which, Absolutely. We've had a long history of religious violence. And we haven't even talked about, uh, again, you know, we are the West, but just 60 years ago in Germany, an unspeakable horror took place. Yes. Uh, and those weren't Arabs. Right. And those weren't Muslims. That's right. So it's, I think it's important to remember that these things are not limited to one group. Or we, in not only this country, but in this time, uh, have difficulty with context and with history and with perspective. Uh, and we, we tend to think about what happened yesterday, but maybe not the day before. Uh, yes, there's a huge, long history that uh, we have to put this into the context of. And maybe that will make us wiser about how to handle this problem. Capitalize the maybe. Yes. Um, Walter Reich, thank you very much for being on Policy Watch and being here at the University of Maryland. Thank you. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.